Thanks for coming. So this session firstly is not a memorial about Dan as a person, it's about the legacy of his work and there are fantastic tributes online including on our, on our website which is a bit the person and the work, another one by Adam Grubb up the beach website that I highly recommend. But what we're going to do is a bit of a presentation that I've thrown together last minute and I think hopefully some of the images of the person but also some of his key representations of some of his significant work and then invite others to make reflections on the influence of his work on them and, and their permaculture work that will do outside, move outside to do that. And Rabina as senior New Zealand elder, Akira elder from Dan's home territory to do some sort of a ceremonial no, honouring. Yeah. honouring. Yeah, so how many people here have done a course with Dan, either online or in person? How many people have watched a video of him or um, read something online? Yeah, wow, that online resource. And uh, how many people have just heard people talk about this, like Dan Palmer or something about his work and a sort of curious? Um, Ah, yeah, yeah, so we've been to, to talks. Okay, so I titled this Making Permaculture Stronger and of course many people would be aware of the huge work of the blog, the online website, Making Permaculture Stronger, but I'm using it in a more generic sense to speak about the total of his legacy because he made permaculture stronger and more interconnected in many different ways. Now tragically that was of the cost to himself and his family that Dan, you could say, burnt the candle of his passion at both ends and succumbed to depression and suicide last year. So this review is more about that incredible legacy he left rather than his personal story. And I found, you know, I need to acknowledge myself that uh, I can't say too much about Dan without tears coming over that. And just to put that in perspective, as the co-originator of permaculture, I've been influenced by many people, some of them direct mentors, like Bill Mollison and the person who I regard my second mentor in permaculture. Pakatane in New Zealand and I've collaborated with a huge number of, of people of my own era and many colleagues younger and I think I've been at pains to acknowledge there's not many people younger who I've worked with and mentored that I then looked up to them and was led by them. I, I can't really think of many, but Dan Harmer is definitely one of those. Yeah. So, uh, the first thing I wanted to mention in the legacy is starting permablitz. In Melbourne, first group photo of the first ever permablitz in 2006. There's Dan in the back there, with a whole bunch of expatriate South Americans in rental place in the southeastern suburbs. Really atypical sort of permaculture uh, group. And it's really interesting, someone who was a philosophy lecturer at Monash University had a tenured position offer in New York and two book contracts to write on philosophy, which he later paid back the advances on those because he became disillusioned with all the radical philosophers he saw when he sort of met them in their daily lives. They just lived the same middle class lives as everyone else. 
their ideas seem to have no impact on not just even the world, but not even their own lives. And so he was searching for something else. And he did a course with Bill Molson and Jeff Lawton. And at that course was another guy who was a complete computer nerd and early internet activist, Adam Grubb. And Adam said to me that Dan generously said that Adam was the co-originator of Permanence. But this eating the suburbs one backyard at a time, I thought was lovely. But of course, the interesting thing about this is that it was that mechanism to get inexperienced Permies, people who've done a permaculture design course, to get their hands dirty, not just in the soil, but hands dirty design work in an exchange system that involved a completely outside of the monetary economy. So it was really one of those sort of post-PDC emergent opportunities. And, you know, there was an article by Asha Beer and Catherine in the, published in The Age in July. Sorry, Asha's in the photo. Yeah, on the right. She's there. Wait, you're going, you're going, yeah, sure. that's Asha. Ah, uh, yes. I have met her times, <laughs> probably more than a few. Great. Yeah, so that was published in July 2007. And yeah, there was this huge sort of thing of that viral spread through the internet and that spread around the world, of course. I think Dan's enthusiasm and adoption of permaculture design, professional consultancy, jobs and I don't quite understand what was the process but he did suffer a deep down of depression after what he considered a serious project failure over actually inappropriate swales putting a design that he decided was a technical disaster and a social disaster with the client. But it was unusual that someone would have that sort of experience and it would just actually sort of crash them down and question everything. And from what I understand from Adam Grubb, it was actually coming out of that that he went to Uganda. And I don't understand a lot about his time in Africa and in India. But of course, that's where he met his partner, Amanda, his wife and the mother of his children. But to follow up this tribute to Dan from this man on YouTube because there is a huge project of nature that I haven't fully investigated that oh that this man says all of these projects that we manage involving thousands of people owe their origins to what Dan brought and taught and they were naming the Uganda Tropical Permaculture Education Institute after Dan. So I know very little about that work, but it's a huge part of his legacy. And coming back to Melbourne, founded Beach with Adam Grubb in 2009 and other colleagues as a culture consultancy. And I acted as a mentor to them in developing the the business strategy for that and the various aspects that I thought it was pretty exciting, you know, this ex-philosopher and computer geek turned permaculture activists and evangelists to actually, could they make the transition to successful business enterprise? And I think Veg has been one of the more successful modest businesses, not big business, I don't know if there's any big culture businesses, you know, that does employ people, provides good employment opportunities, that was mostly suburban design focused and efficiently doing those designs, involving clients with the designs and offering implementation services. And that that development was also around design process. And I just love this graphic of sort of Veg describing 
okay, this is what we can offer. So those elements of this thinking about design process context were sort of being built very early on and already well inoculated against the idea that here we provide this thing called a permaculture design and then that you've got. Now it's this integration between what is the possibilities of the land context and the people across. But you know, that went through to Adam Grubb's story about the revolutionising the wicking bed system over a beer. Design tweaks to sort of simple physical things that became part of their manufacturing template for this is the, the technology we provide and that a part of that rollout of, oh, you know, wicking beds providing effective growing space in gardens where it's often competitive tree roots and other things. And that scaling up of that and doing sort of commercial scale you know, public jobs and also that sourcing of appropriate timber, the recycled cypress and africarpa from salvage. So some of those practical elements that what we used to say about permaculture design, how would architects design buildings if there wasn't a building industry? Well, that was a problem for early permaculture design. How does a permaculture designer design things when there weren't the contractors or whatever to do these things? And so that process of that design and installation and to some extent servicing those things. The other side, a veg of course was permaculture education and the photo I took in Spring Creek, the veg PDC held annually for many years at Yandoy Farm in central Victoria. Adam, Dan and his daughter there next to him, Michael Jackson, the owner of Yandoy Farm, which was also a major permaculture consultancy project where Dan felt came to me and felt, gee, this is too big and too complex. Whereas I'd pointed the consultancy request from Michael Jackson to Veg, and then Dan contacted Darren Doherty and got him involved in the sort of key line design aspects. Then he got me to come down and do a reading landscape on that. Um, and that triggered a whole process in where we work together that led to the last project we'll talk about, the Reading Landscape Film. But this design process development that they use both in teaching design on PDCs and in using in their client processes was part of a, a really strong element of focus on design is the core thing of what a PDC is about. And taking tools that were strong influences in, in, in permaculture like PA Yeoman Scale of Permanence, both teaching that and tweaking that. And taking it out of the context that Yeoman's used and saying, now this is actually a really universal tool in lots of other contexts. So I think like with all things Dan did, he threw himself into something full immersion and in love with ideas and application and then start to see the weaknesses in it and become quite critical. But he had that capacity to take it and improve it and incorporate it into the next thing. And I think one of the next things was holistic decision making. And this is a screen grab from the website that you can go and find. And there's him reposting Brent Quinlan's notes on holistic decision making course that he did with. So this is, of course, taking the work of Alan Savory, a long-term influence on permaculture, but working out the broader scale in holistic brain chain management and saying, can we take the thinking tools out of that and that have more 
universal application. I put that photo in there from the later website, Making Permaculture Stronger, where he came back and interviewed Alan Savory as one of many of the influences on his work. But there's also a, a photograph where of him showing Alan Savory how he uses Alan Savory's work and has adapted it. And, ah, yes. So this process where we were recipients of as clients at Meliodora, where he helped us create this holistic context for Meliodora, and that was a, a thing we did between myself and Sue, Nick Ritter and Kirsten Bradley, who are living at, at, at Meliodora at the time, and our son Oliver Holmgren and his partner Tess Seller, to think about how does what really is Meliodora in its core as a framework for what it might be in the future. And that was just a draft evolving context, but it's been very powerful for us. And I know that Dan brought that process back to VEG, which was reaching a crisis point where Adam was thinking of leaving. This is getting too stressful, and they used that process incredibly successfully with staff to put the business on a much more solid foundation. Okay, so Making Permaculture Stronger was started in March 2016, and I think in the years preceding, Dan was becoming more and more discontent and critical of permaculture, and was on the verge of dumping permaculture completely as not fit for purpose. He came to me to talk about his ideas and I encouraged him in what he was doing, his focus and interest in design and process. Maybe that was a contributor to him continuing with that. And that website, through to the time of his death in July 2020, there's 184 posts on it about 30 each year, and including 83 interviews and podcasts. It is a massive resource. So, I just want to look at a few of the ideas in that because this was part of his rediscovery of the work of Christopher Alexander and an early post on Making Permaculture Stronger was part of called Christopher Alexander's Challenge for Permaculture. That this was his graphic description of permaculture's default design process. You start with elements, separate parts, and you assemble them, like on a factory assembly line of a car, and you create a whole, and when it's complete, it's a functioning whole. Now, obviously, you know, this is very challenging and it's a simplification and whatever. And he showed in contrast Christopher Alexander's design, the de default design approach that starts with the whole. There already is something. It is, whatever it is, it is a whole thing. And then the, the living process is by which it differentiates into parts the way an embryo forms by cellular differentiation that eventually differentiates <coughs> and that that creates ideally living design whereas this creates a dead mechanical process. Pretty full on challenge. And the going back to the his reinvigoration of the permaculture tree, which is in permaculture one, and saying everything has got to go through this trunk of design process from general foundations to specific solutions. And I hadn't seen before this Brenner's redrawing of those, his sketches to illustrate that. So 
those early aspects of, of the first part of making culture stronger were looking at the weak link of design process and then how do you fix it? How do you make that stronger? And I think this was sort of the, a bit of a distillation of that, that you can see in the, the assembly idea versus the petitioning idea. And on the bottom, there's the fabricating where the, you complete the concept design and the detailed design, like an architect doing concept planning and then detailed specifications and drawings. And all that is done before you start doing anything physically. And at the other end, you've got a design where the concept and the details emerge as you go. And this hybrid where, that a lot of us would be familiar with, where there's a concept design up front and the detailed design emerges as you go. A lot of my design work involved that, the strategic and the concept design, and then we say, okay, we're going to identify this thing that's the first thing to do, maybe a shelter belt design, and here's some detailed specifications for that. Let's get that in place and then see what. But that he saw that most permaculture design was down in this fabricating assembly, but edging into elements of Alexander's petitioning and edging into elements of hybrid design. And he was saying, we needed to get right there, where it's both working from whole and parts perspective simultaneously, and it's completely generative. The trouble with that, of course, is that when it's actually happening, it just looks completely invisible. It just looks like chaos. It, like there's no recipe. There's no formula. It just looks like what Dan would call winging it from the outside. People just randomly doing things. But it's the very opposite. So that was a, a, a place he he got to when he started what he called the living design process, and this is another website of his. And this was the Maybury Wood End was the first living design process consultancy. And there were existing two existing houses <coughs> and two sisters and their husbands and children buying that property together and developing it. And there was an existing dam and then Dan coming in and engaging in a, what appeared to be an incredibly elaborate process of working with the people context and the land context where he was really a facilitator of them designing, not them the design consultant. And simultaneously, around that time, in fact that year, a few months later, we collaborated on the first advanced permaculture design process for that course in Hepburn. This photo is actually from a photo by Sonia Lee, who was a participant in the April 2019, the last of those, those courses. But those courses were building on courses that I'd already <coughs> doing, but bringing in his whole Alexander Ed critique of permaculture and his living design process, where I was focusing on a lot on reading landscape, and he was a lot focusing on, on reading the people content. But I really like this photo of him illustrating a particular design process and people being really struck by it, but it's actually my own fascination uh, <laughs> that uh, it, that photo captures. Uh, what is he doing? <laughs> what is that? Is that thing? box. And this, right at this moment, I can't remember that exercise. I can't remember that either. Like, I remember enjoying it, and I remember being absolutely fascinated by it, but I can't remember what it was well, 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 maybe that was what, the, the work of the magician. There's the, the two sisters and their husbands, and me and Sue and Dan at Maybury. But I think this screen grab from Making Permaculture Stronger, where he said, yeah, this phase one was the space 
I work term culture practitioners come together with a spirit of strengthening the design system aspect of term culture by clarifying its weaknesses and coordinating efforts to address them. Where the best way I know to strengthen something is to identify weak links and then direct energy toward making them less weak. But then he moved on to say this focus on problems, even if the problems are getting solved, does not and cannot solve the problem, that the whole approach of solving problems is itself well problematic. Mm. Now, okay, talk about <laughs> mind-boggling ontology, <laughs> but it's a fundamental critique of permaculture is about solutions focused, taking the problems, even that the problem is the solution. By that aphorism, we're starting to get close to getting out of the problem mindset. That one of his big influences, Carol Sanderson, said, no, life doesn't actually have problems. Life has emergent characteristics to work with. The problem thing is a technical, <coughs> mechanical fix thing in our heads. These Trojan horses that we carry with us. And this idea that he was actually cutting down the tree. <coughs> but that it was actually because there was this weak graft that never properly took and get out the chainsaw, cut down the permaculture tree, but it coppices again from its roots, which is a sort of amazing, powerful analogy. So he went on to interview these people, some of those names, Alan Savory, the big influence I mentioned, mentioned Carol Sanford, Bill Reed, Tyson Young, Tyson Young Porter, and key people within permaculture who were significant contributors and in many cases collaborators with him. Myself, Ro Morrow, Darren Garrity, Moray Gamble, Robert Francis, Louis McNamara, Joel Glass, the permaculture designer but collaborator with Carol yeah. Sanford, Dave Jackie, Finn Mapsley and, and Glenn Marshall from New Zealand. Among all of these people, you would recognise some of their names, probably not. All of them. Dave Hurstead, I believe, was the person who actually personally presented the living design process at the International Convergence in India, student and, and collaborator with Dan. It, it was he the person, Rebecca? No, Dave Hursthaus, yeah. Yeah, David, yeah. David Hursthaus. All of these things are on line. This is the Maybury property. And it's also that it was working with earth moving contractors and tree planting contractors in central Victoria that had this long lineage of working with both me and Darren Doherty. So this project was also picking up with this you know, incredible collaborative lineage that you can't do all these things without the people who have those on ground skills. So Jennings Earth Moving and Dave Griffiths, Keyline tree planting, contract and dam. So I think, you know, this is a pretty amazing legacy of teachers, mentors and collaborators. I think that's far from a complete list, but some of the more significant ones. And key influences outside of permaculture, I put Christopher Alexander at, at the top of that list, Alan Savory and Carol Sanford. I can remember him saying, this woman, this work is incredible. And I thought, yeah, Dan, I'll get to look at it sometime. But it was only after his death that I went back and looked at those. Some of the key design projects, many veg urban designs, Yandoit Farm, Limestone Road in Guildford, over Mayfield property I've mentioned, the East Brunswick Village, multi-storey apartment block development where Dan collaborated with a developer where the developer wanted Veg to do rooftop gardens and Dan came in and said, these are the conditions for us to work and he was expecting the security guard to come in and hook him out the door and the developer said at the end of the presentation, when do we start? And he said, no, you don't understand, you know, like, I want the ability to change what the architects and the landscape architects have done 
and it just sort of kept upping the thing and the guy saying, yeah, you can do it. <laughs> you know? And I think it was an example of a developer who was wondering, what is my legacy? So Dan went into the, for the first time actually working in that development industry, key websites, the Veg website, making permaculture stronger, holistic decision making, and living design process. And the last thing I wanted to mention was a film project which started as an organic process of him filming me on his camera reading landscape, which then became part of what we taught, where me attempting to talk to people about reading landscape and not really understanding until he read me reading landscape and gave me the language of what I was doing. Mm. This inspecting, aspecting, and which is an old <coughs> verb in old English that we have lost, and sidespecting. And that that then leads to retrospecting, where have things come from, and finally prospecting, mm -hmm. actually seeing the future or seeing where things are going. And, oh, I know how a framework for describing what I actually do. And so that led on an organic process to the film Reading Landscape, and that should be on that list of websites too. It's really Dan's project. I was a bit embarrassed about it because it's about me and our <laughs> Reading Landscape on all these projects. He's in from Victoria. The filmmaker, David Maher, working on that collaboratively. <coughs> it was a crowdfunding I think How many people are aware of that project? Yeah, so a, a few. David Ma and I are close to sort of completing that project and there will be a, a launch of that uh, film in, probably in Central Victoria this winter. And there is two books that were in draft form. We're not sure what may happen with them but so far the website's secured to maintain that work. So at that point, I'd like to move outside.